So, uh, welcome to Multiple Streams by Any Means podcast geared towards showing our people different ways to make money while also putting a spotlight on entrepreneurs, content creators, and business professionals. Um, I'm your host, Bam, and we also got my co-host, Jason Wyatt Pro. Man, today we got a special uh, special talent, man. He's a man of many, many different business ventures. Uh, he's also uh, one of the hosts of the B2, B2M. B2L. B2M, mm-hmm. Boys and Men yep. podcast, yep. where they talk about, um, you know, their story as um, coming up as far as kids and parenthood and things of that nature, man. Um, so today, man, hailing from Virginia, we got Wacky, my man. brother Wacky. Appreciate you coming, sir. Thank y'all for having me, man. I'm so excited to be here, man. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And uh, <laughs> hopefully through this conversation, we will give someone yes. a one thing that they can take from it that will make a difference in their life. I love it. That's the whole Absolutely. idea. That's the whole goal, man. Um, so we'll get the basics, man. Where you, where you from? Where you from? Man, born and raised in Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. You know, you, the home of the University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson, Monticello, <laughs> That's what that's 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 what we are known for. I always like to say, uh, Central Virginia is what I like to call the the womb of America. Mm-hmm. So in our area, we have Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, James Madison, all came from this little you know, 30, 40 minute radius okay. uh, right there in Charlottesville. And then when you think that. about even like development of the country, when it comes to uh, someone like John Marshall, not too far away, or uh, Lewis and Clark, when they went on the expedition, they mm-hmm. were all in our area. These are all people who are local to to Charlottesville, and so okay. Thomas Jefferson, being the father of the Declaration of Independence, and writing that and creating this awesome, amazing country, <laughs> and then uh, you know, uh, it's just been an interesting journey, mm-hmm. you know, being being from there. So right. I always say that's that's the origins of Charlottesville. But as of late, we've been known for the tiki torch marches. Look at y'all. You know, the, 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 the Nazis, when they showed up and hit the girl in the car, Heather Heyer, oh, and hit her, that, that was in our hometown. So that was, that was right there uh, where we were. Wow. wow. So that, that, that thing almost became synonymous with our town. If you watch politics or something like that, they may reference Charlottesville. They're referencing the Nazis and the Trump marchers showing up. And then you know, and you the, said that where you was at. That was you yeah, doing. we were there. We were we were we were there that day. We were the we were the counter protesters that day. Okay. So me, my wife, uh, and my two sons, we all went down there. And you know, you know, I know leading up to that march at that time, people were saying to us, "Why are you guys going down there? Just ignore those people. Just ignore those people." And I was like, "Nah." I was like, <laughs> "If if somebody told me my wife." had stage four cancer, I would not ignore that. Facts. You know, and I believe that racism is a cancer on our society. Mm-hmm. And we must deal with that accordingly. And so I wanted to take my family down there, I wanted to take my sons down there, because I wanted those young fellas to know that, look, dealing with this racism in this country, it is not someone else's problem. Mm-hmm. It is your, your problem. fight to fight as well. Yeah, and you must stand and make your voice heard and be present when it comes to dealing with racism and stuff like that. We never want to make it an excuse Mm -hmm. for not being successful, but you have to understand that it's a problem in our country and we have to deal with it. And you, young fella, have a responsibility to deal with that. And I wanted them to be there, be present, see it, feel it, know what it's like, see those dudes with you know, racist, all Nazis and all that yeah. stuff, you know, Confederate flags, and they carry AK-47s <laughs> and AR-15s. Wow. And to be that close and know that one of those that guys could pick that gun up and take our whole family out yeah. and to know what that feels like, yes, sir. you know, and, and that you got a responsibility to speak against that, and it's not okay, and it's not acceptable. Nah, that's a cool experience, right. man. Oh. Was uh, history, social studies like your favorite subject growing up? No, I ain't had no favorite subject. I was terrible in school. (laughs) He means he liked every subject. (laughs) Man, I hated school from fifth, from first grade to graduation. Man, I, I was, I was, I was not a good student. And um, 
you know, my mm -hmm. uncle used to always, my uncle had this little saying, he was like, nephew, don't worry about it. If you don't like school, don't worry about it. He used to always tell me mm -hmm. the A students teach the B students to work for the C students. Ooh, mm -hmm. tell them again. You know, <laughs> and so, so I bought into that hook, line, and sinker, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I heard somebody add on to that. The A students teach the B students to work for the C students and the D students dedicate the buildings. You know, so I heard somebody say that, so I'm like, all right, I, I bought into it. I'm like, all right, I don't need no grades, I'm good. <laughs> it was um, growing up. It was a lot of you guys, siblings wise, or just me and my brother, uh, okay. sibling. But we were raised, you know. And when, when I talk about a village, it was a village. Mm -hmm. You know, my my grandma, who's alive today, she on the 25th of this month, she's gonna be 94, oh, wow. and she is still she's sharp still as right ever. Here. You know what I mean? Her house was always home base for all of us, yeah. you know, it's a whole bunch of nieces and nephews and grandkids cousins. and cousins and yeah. everybody would yeah. always come back to that home base. So, That's you know, we was raised around aunts, uncles and cousins and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. it was, it, it was, it was a good environment, but just siblings, just me and my brother and, and my, my parents. Okay. Okay. You know, Outside my, of grade school, did you go to college? Yeah, I, I went to, uh, I, after I graduated from high school, I took two years off. I was just floundering. Couldn't yeah. figure out what I wanted to do. Um, during that time, I got a real estate license. So that was the beginning of the interest in real estate. But uh, during those two years, you know, the 80, I graduated in 89. So 89 and 91, you know, that's the height of the crack epidemic and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Police harassing us like 89. crazy. Mm -hmm. So I just realized, you know what, I'm going to get out of here before they set me up. <laughs> I'm going to go to college yeah. and get away from them. So right. uh, John, the guy you met earlier, we were roommates at Virginia Union. We went to HBCU, okay. and we played football there. So mm -hmm. I played football at HBCU in the early 90s. Yeah, so that, that was my college experience. And, and, was a, and was a really good student when I got there. Okay. Because I had made some decisions about, you know, doing, doing a really good job and, and, and taking my academics serious. Mm -hmm. And... And when you take those two years off, you come to college with a different level of maturity. Okay. You know, yeah, so right. so I wasn't I wasn't on yeah. all of that all that nonsense that everybody a lot of other freshmen yeah. might have been on. You know. Yeah. No. Um, I went to uh, when I first started. So I went to Auburn State, another HBCU. Okay. Um, yeah, I started spring semester because I graduated uh, high school kind of early. And I started uh, spring semester, and yeah, just that avoiding that college rush i mean which is the funnest part about college probably mm -hmm. being a freshman fall semester yeah but just being in the spring semester it kind of made me more of an outcast not necessarily on campus but more so i didn't get that experience so i had a different mindset you know when it just came to getting things done some of the bad seeds already yeah you know taught, put themselves out of the race and um yeah so um what, what was the school you said you were virginia in? union in richmond virginia, virginia. Union, just Union? Yeah, Virginia Union University. And oh, it's okay. in Richmond, Virginia. What'd you take up? Uh, I was a finance major. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I was, I, was, I was a good student. I was in the, you know, Sidney Lewis School of Business at Virginia Union. I was, I was a really good student. I, I had plans of, of going to Wall Street when I finished. That was my original plan. Got to go, but... Um, but then my son was born my, wow. my third year. So, I, I planned derail. Derail. You know, yeah. it didn't have to be. Now, you know, now that I'm old, I look back on it, I was like, man, nah, that was just a cop-out, you know, on my part. <laughs> I, I just copped out, you know what I mean? But, uh, but yeah, that, yeah, something. So, my son was born, and so that, that was it. Okay. Doing, doing so your I college years, finished. were you still doing real estate as well? No. When I, when I, I was interested in real estate, and I took the, I, uh, took the class. Yeah. And I passed the class, mm -hmm. but I never went to take the exam. So, right, exactly. Because. Yeah, because we was running the streets. streets. <laughs> it's a young man. Yeah, we, it we, happens. We, we was being stupid, yeah. You know, and so I, and so it was back there in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but you know, but really, I was just like, yo, I just need to get away from the city because the police keep pulling us over and all that stuff. And I was just like, let me get out of here. So that just put everything like on hold. hold. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's up. You said, and you were playing football? Yeah. What position? Wide receiver. 
So that was that was eighty pounds ago, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look, now I look like a right guard, but I look like a wide receiver back then. Hey. I, I had some muscles then. <laughs> hey, it's okay, man. I like the water boy. Man. Uh, <laughs> it's well, all good. That was uh, the only sports you played coming up. You played. I played basketball, basketball in high school. Basketball. Yeah, basketball. A lot of basketball. Athlete. Mostly basketball. Actually, I only played football because my buddy was playing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't even my thing. I, I just played because he was playing. Mm. And just happen to be decent at it. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, now that's what's up. Um, so, like, was real estate your first, like, you know, getting your feet wet as far as entrepreneurship? Uh, you know, real estate was the first time I, I took it serious. So, um, so fast forward. I, 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 um, I take the class when I'm, like, 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. But then I, once my son is born, I work a series of jobs because I'm just like, all right. So, so I spent most of the 90s um, in the hotel business. I was a doorman at a five-star hotel. Okay. So that was a super cool gig. But you understand it's only so many $5 tips. You know, you got <laughs> to gotta do something else. And so in that time, you know, I, I, had, um, I had grown when I was younger. So my first taste of entrepreneurship well, my uncle introduced me to the scalping tickets. Okay. So I started scalping tickets when I was seven years old. Oh, wow. So I was, oh, wow. I was at all of the UVA games, all of the UVA basketball and football games from the time I was seven up until three years ago, bro. I just mm -hmm. gave it up three years ago. Scalping tickets. Scalping tickets. Yo, it'd be so funny, man. I'm the board president for a nonprofit at home, and board members will walk past and see me outside <laughs> scalping tickets. They'd be like... What in the world? <laughs> but it was something I did because, you know, my uncle had introduced me to the mm -hmm. game and it taught me everything I needed to know about entrepreneurship. Yeah, that definitely And is. so, but at that point, you know, as I got older, it was just so many people that just relied on me weekly for, for their tickets and everybody called my phone <laughs> so much you every day. <laughs> that I just, that I just continued to do it. So that was that was my real introduction, you know, scalping tickets, raking leaves, shoveling snow, all okay, of that really, stuff. Really and, and my uncle Mike gave us that game, you yeah. know, he, he gave us that game. So he taught us, you know, how to go out there and hustle and how to get it. Um, I tell people all the time that the the fact that I knew how to go hustle and get it is what truly allowed me to be an entrepreneur because I never felt like I would starve. Okay. I always felt like I could make some money some way. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And so many times yeah. people don't go off on their entrepreneurial journeys because they worried about not having money. Yeah. But when you know you can hustle up on some money mm -hmm. and you can make it happen, so that good. gives you the confidence and the courage to go out there and, 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 and take some chances in the entrepreneurial yeah. world. Nah, so yeah. when I was, you know, when I was working those jobs at the hotel, I was doing everything, doing Amway, I did Excel, <laughs> I did, you know, phone service, legal service, any type of multi-level marketing business I could yeah. do, I was really trying to find it. Yeah. And um, when I was around 30 years old, um, me and my partner, Corey, and my friend, a lot of the same group of friends that you'll meet, mm -hmm. um, okay. we, we started a newspaper, African American newspaper in Charlottesville, it's called the African American Reflector. Oh, and dope. so we ran the black newspaper in town for several years. Okay. And we also started a production company called Wacky Entertainment, where we bought comedians and jazz musicians and all that. We bought Ricky Smiley to the area, okay. and okay. we bought all kinds of entertainment to the area. So I was like, if I'm going to stay in Charlottesville, if I'm not going to follow my brother to Atlanta, mm -hmm. what do <laughs> I need to do to make my hometown better? And I felt like we need, one, we needed to give the Charlottesville African-American community a voice. Okay. We did that with the newspaper. And two, we needed to give that same community entertainment um, options. Okay. And so we, and so that's what we did. And we did that for several years. Um, and so I was doing all of that stuff. And that's around 30. So I got my real estate license at 30 years old. Okay. And <laughs> I remember... Uh, the first house I sold, um, a brother named, uh, I don't know if y'all might know, he, he has a, 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 a practice here in, in, in the Atlanta area. His name is Dr. El Amin. Um, he'll, El Amin Orthopedics. 
And uh, he was the very first house I ever sold, man. And, and I remember I got the check, and it was for like $5,000. And I was just looking at that bad boy. I was just like, yo. I was like, okay, like all of that other stuff I was doing, we, we would make pennies, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, but but five time. Gs, I'm like, okay. Yeah, found you something. I, I got it. I got yeah, it. I'm going to yeah. do this. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and so that's when I was like, all right. Get rid of the newspaper, get rid of entertainment, <laughs> everything. you know. And my sons are growing up, too, at this time. So they're, like, you know, really, really young, seven, four, whatever. Okay. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gone too much because I'm doing so much. Mm. I need to put that down, and this is what's making money. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to put all that stuff down. I remember one day, it was a pivotal moment for me. We were outside in the driveway. We were playing basketball. My son was like, check ball, check ball. And my phone rung in my pocket. Go ahead. And I went to grab my phone. And my son just looked at me. He was like, you bet not answer that. <laughs> so that was a, 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 that, was a, that was a shift in my thinking. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get rid of that newspaper. I'm going to get rid of the entertainment company. I'm going to sell houses because I know that works. I'm going to coach my son's Pop Warner team. I'm going to coach his AAU basketball team. Mm. I'm going to take him to school every morning. I'm going to pick him up every afternoon. So much so, at one point, he started to think I didn't work at all, <laughs> which was another bad decision, you know what I mean? And I realized, oh, you got, he got to see you do something. You know, but I, my, I was just made, I made my world completely around my sons. Nah, that's beautiful. Yeah. And so that's what, that's what I was like, all right, let me, let me go ahead and let him see me at least take a phone call every now, now and then, then, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still working. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. He thought you were like the dude from Martin Tommy. Yeah, 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 Not exactly. No he ain't got no job. Well, he ain't got no job. Yeah, man. one day he was like, Dad, you don't do nothing. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I was like, okay, I, I made that mistake. That's not, once again, I was saying before we started, mm -hmm. you know, more things are caught than taught. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. so yeah. He, that's what he was picking up. Yeah. Yeah. He was picking up like, I always see you. You're always here. Every day. You coach. You take me to school. You pick me up. You coach my team. You at dinner every night. Like, you all, when do you do anything? Because I had real estate, so I was able to craft my life around mm, their lives. And that was, the, that was the number one thing real estate yeah. gave me was the opportunity to craft my life mm. around my family. Okay. Because I knew, you know, that quality of life was super-duper important. And so... I, at that time, I was like, all right, put my boys on pause. In turn, I'm going to raise my boys. I'm going to put all this chasing money on pause. And I'm going to raise my sons. When they get 20 years old, whatever, I can go back to chasing money. money. Yeah. So now yeah. I'm back to chasing money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got now I'm back now. to chasing. Yeah, it's, exactly. real, it's real sacrifice right there, man. So yeah. Salute that. That's what's up. Um, I don't know what made me think of it. Well, I know what made me. When you were talking about the ticket scalping, yeah. remind me of that movie Money Talks. You ever saw that movie? With I have it. I have it. I have it. That was his main profession. He was a, he was a ticket. Scout. Really? Yeah, oh, I gotta the, watch that. Yeah, he had the Phantom of the Opera ticket. That, that was his. Oh that yeah. Was his. yeah, 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 man. Ain't nothing like when Duke Blue Devils and North Carolina Tar Heels coming to town. <laughs> you know, that's a good day. You know, and of course, you know, we had the hometown of Dave Matthews Band is from Charlottesville. Dave Matthews. Yeah. So whenever they have a show at home. That's always a, that's always said, a big event. A yeah, yeah, yeah. That was always a big event. So North Carolina, you know, Duke basketball, Clemson, Miami, Florida State football, mm -hmm. all of those were always good. So man, I've been I've been going to those games ever since I was seven, and I probably I've missed one football game in forty plus years, wow. and I miss um, uh, and I, I and I miss maybe. 10 basketball games, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right, so what was your Phantom of the Opera in a ticket scale? Like, what was your high, you know, expensive tickets, you know, as far as back then when you were doing your thing as far as ticket scale? Best tickets we ever sold, man, was when Zion Williams was playing at Duke. Zion, oh, yeah. Yeah, like that ain't even that long ago. That was 2019. Yeah, I know that was 2019. <laughs> that was like the last year I did it. Okay. So, yeah, that was the last year I did it, and Zion tickets was going for, you know, a basket, college basketball game. They're going for 2500 a piece. Oh, snap. College basketball. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Virginia was really good. Yeah, you got, whether you keep up with college basketball or not, but Virginia, 
my team actually won a national championship that year. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, but but they lost to Duke twice. They had Zion. They lost three games that year. Mm. Lost to Duke twice, but they won a national championship. So, mm. so yeah. So that was that was my you know you know that was always good you know. And so when I'm out there scalping tickets, it's a good thing because, bro, I'm ten years old and I can make three hundred dollars scalping tickets, five hundred dollars scalping tickets. You know what I mean? And as I got older, you know, you put more money into it and you have big days. So, you know, days, you know, Zion game, I don't know, we probably made about $16,000 scalping tickets. In one day? In one day. Is that that's well, like a team well, of people? Well, it's, 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 it's for one event okay. because people are calling like the week leading up to it and I'm selling them four here, four there, two, two here, here, two there. there. Okay. And so... Um, and then, you know, for that one event, I think we probably did about 16000 So, So you were never the type of person that sit outside the stadium. Uh, that's exactly where I was. That's exactly where you were. That's was. exactly where I was. Yeah, I only my, – once my son got into the business, then we took it in-house. Okay. okay. And we started doing more stuff online. But I was still out there, man, 50 degrees on a Tuesday night. They playing Boston College. You ever, sold some, you ever sold some dud tickets, though? I have, I have, but uh, one of the things that I think made my business and me really credible mm -hmm. is if I sold somebody a fake and they came back to me, mm -hmm. I would give them their money back okay. and I would eat it. Okay. And I, and I always told my son, you know, because I'm teaching my son out there, and I'm like, it's the cost of doing business, all right, and you always operate this business with a high level of integrity, you know, because sometimes people have tickets and they're like, Hey, are you gonna sell this ticket or are you gonna go in? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, no, tell them I'm gonna sell this ticket. ticket yeah. You know, and if they don't want to sell it to you, that's fine. It's their ticket. Somebody else yeah. will sell you one. Facts. You know, yeah. somebody, somebody gonna walk past you. You got an extra ticket. They are gonna be like, uh, no, and I wouldn't sell it to you. I wipe my ass <laughs> with it before I give it to you. Yeah, that's how they do. And I would tell my son, never be jaded by that person, because the next person is gonna come along and they are gonna say, yeah, I got four tickets here. Yeah. You can have them make yourself a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So you got to understand that both of these people exist in the world. And so it, as I'm coaching my son through this experience, I want him to go on and be an entrepreneur and all this stuff. And what I told him was everything you've learned in the business world, you've learned out here. Yeah. Now, when you go in that classroom, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. but a different term. Yes, sir. You know, it ain't. Hey, get rid of that ticket kickoff about to start. It's in the classroom, it's price curve. Yeah. In the classroom, it's decaying asset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing, different name, mm -hmm. different place. So right. you so you're gonna be well versed. You're gonna know how to deal with the dude that's on drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. out here trying to make a buck so he can get high. Mm -hmm. And you're also gonna talk to the CEO of X business in town because he the one yeah. with the extra tickets. tickets. You know, and so it's going to teach you how to deal with everybody. And so I, it was just a great training ground for my son in terms of his entrepreneurial journey, um, you know, doing that. So you're yeah, dope. So you're probably, I guess with that, with that hustle, it would tell buying season ticket holders and just buying. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. Just, bingo. And now my son, is, I got two sons, 29 and 25 years old. Okay. So my, my oldest son has a non-emergency medical transportation company that he oh, that's started. Dope. That's and, dope. That, but that was his second business. He went to college and studying sustainable business, mm -hmm. and the business he started was a ticket business. Mm. So it was like a cross between uh, StubHub and Eventbrite. Wow. But it was for high school sports. So you know how now when you go to a high school game, they make you do it on your phone oh, and all yeah, that. My yeah. son has started that in 2017. Yeah. All right. He had worked on it from 2017 all the way to 2020. Mm. The day they finally got the app ready, the day they ready to launch was March 23rd, 2020. COVID happened. Country, country shut, shut down. down. Oh, no yeah. events. Wow. So in that moment, I'm sitting there looking at him like, all right, entrepreneur, what you going to do? Got to pivot. <laughs> yeah. And he had been driving Uber and Yellow Cab while he was doing that. Okay. He was like, well, I've been doing Uber and Yellow Cab. I think I can start a transportation company. Mm. I can do a transportation company. And I was like, all right, come up with a name. He was like, I already got the name. I said, what is it? He's like, Swift. You know, safe with your fast, reliable transportation. I was like, okay, I like that. 
And my wife was like, well, you need a car, you need a van. She went online, Craigslist, found a van. Mm. I went online, set up the LLC. Mm. Like literally, we sitting there in the living room. Mm. Oh, that's powerful. Literally, we did that's that. Powerful. The next day, we went to Harrisonburg and bought a van for $1,700. That was his first vehicle. Mm. That was in March, June, he did his first trip. Mm. Now, he has families working for him. People driving for him, got cars on the road. You know, people, we see the cars in town and all that stuff. It's super cool, man. It's mm. providing jobs and opportunity for folks. And um, he's 29 years old, doing really, doing really well. And you said that was less than like, three years? Yeah, yeah. And he started that at the height of the pandemic, mm. you know, in the 2020. Time yeah. The time when people panicking, not figuring out what they're going to do, he done came up with a solution. Exactly. And it's brilliant because, you know, it was it's non-medical emergency. You know? Exactly. So it's Every, like, yeah, it went hand in hand. It's, 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 it's the healthcare industry mm -hmm. paid for by the government. Yeah, exactly. You can't go wrong, you know, right, and that's exactly. what he's doing. And my 25-year-old son, he's a professional Call of Duty player. He plays video games for a living. Like on Twitch and he streams oh, wow. it and yeah, stuff yeah. like no, that? But he travel all around the world. He just got back from Toronto two weeks ago. So playing video yeah, playing he, a pro, video. he a pro video gamer. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. NBA yep. bit of, uh, that's exactly Call of right. Duty. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Game. Exactly. So Dang. that's what he, he does. And so, you know, as my... When my kids were young, because I coached their teams, when I would be around kids, you would always, you ask a kid that playing AAU basketball or pop one football, what they want to do. Mm -hmm. That kid invariably will tell you, I want to be a professional football player, basketball player. Yeah, yeah, average. And I would always hear what I call the dream killing adults tell them to get a plan B. Well, after being around my kids and coaching some kids, I've seen their friends win a championship with the Milwaukee Bucks. Mm -hmm. I watched my son teammate block for Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. Okay. So I just always told my kids, hey, it's your job to come up with plan A, I got plan B. Whatever you say B is, that's what we'll do. If you say, dad, I wanna be a comedian, bet, let's go, let's make it happen. You know, let's get you an agent, go to New York, go to LA, whatever we gotta do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I told my son, I said, so I, I, let me finish. I told my younger, my oldest son was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's been doing his tickets. Cool, great. Go to college. We're going to learn all this stuff. You're going to be ready. My youngest son at 14 comes to me, and he's like, Dad, I know what I want to do. I'm like, what? I want to be a professional gamer. <laughs> I'm like, man, go ahead with that bush. <laughs> go ahead with that stuff. You know, and, and I was like, okay. You, that's your plan A? He was like, yeah. I went, I studied gaming. And I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. this is about to be big. Okay. This is about to be real big. Yeah. And me and my wife went, and we was like, this is what you want to do? And I asked him, I said, you play? I was like, who the, who one of the best players in the game? He was like, this guy named Simp. I was like, Simp. I was like, I said, are you good like him? He was like, yeah. It's like, you can play like him? Like, Dad, he's my friend. We've been playing since we were 14. I'm like, since we were younger. I was like, oh, so you're this good. You know this guy. So when we made that decision, it was, okay, the first thing people ask me all the time, what did my, how did my son become a professional gamer? Mm -hmm. I jokingly always say, well, it starts with some irresponsible parenting. <laughs> you know, because most parents just won't allow their kids the time to play. Yeah. But I read Malcolm Gladwell's book. I heard about the 10,000 hours to be mm -hmm. excellent at what you're doing. And I'm like, well, he already put in his hours. Well, I'm going to go tell him be an accountant. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, all right, he, you got it. So the first decision we had to make was we're going to allow him the time to play. Man, the adults would come to our house and be like, that boy on the game again? Y'all letting that boy play? This, this, this. <laughs> you know, the school would call us. They have Mr. Wynn. Um, Kari's grades are not, a, I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know, he, but he not, he not going to college. <laughs> He's going to be a gamer. Don't worry about it. We just making him graduate. So y'all can stop calling me. <laughs> like, really, y'all can stop calling me. Really? You know, he, 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 they would look at me like I had two hands, bro. I know. They would be like, he's going to do what? I said, he's going to play video games for a living. Like, and I'm selling, like, he's in, like, 10th grade. And I'm telling him, I'm like, yo, that's what he's going to do. And uh, it's so funny, man. I met with him. the guy who 
was his counselor at the time. I just met with him a week ago. And he wanted to talk about getting in the real estate business. And the first thing he had, house car in the game and going. (laughs) And I'm like, he's doing good. In fact, I'm like, he in Toronto right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting, man. So, you know, you got to, I'm a firm believer that young people absolutely have to pursue their dreams. And stop listening up. Man, don't nobody kill more dreams than mama and grandma and granddad. Mm -hmm. And you know why? It's not because they don't want you to be successful. It's because they have the fears of what stopped them from achieving their successes. And so as a result of that, they're really just trying to protect you. Yeah, that's it. They're really just trying to protect you. But what they do is they put all their limitations on you. And you have to, as a young person, make sure that you don't absorb their traumas right. and their limitations. Yeah. And you have to, if you want, bro... I tell kids all the time, bro, if you want to be a YouTuber, be that. Yeah, right. If you want to be an artist, be that. If you want to be a dancer, be that. Right. And don't let nobody tell you you can't be that. Facts. Nobody. Right. And then go put in the work. Yeah, go put in the work. Yeah. Ah, I love that support yeah, system dope, y'all got, man. man. Yeah, no, nah, that's, that's dope. That's <laughs> let his kids live his, live his dreams, man. It's that's on them, man. No, and that's, no and that's what I told them, you know. And, you know, and, yeah. So my one son has moved out. My gamer son is still at home. People are like, that boy's still at home? I said, yeah, he's still at home. they like, so then they immediately go to, well, I guess, you know, gaming ain't working out. And I, I remember telling my son when he wanted to be a gamer, I said, listen, go ahead. let's talk about what success looks like. I said, let me tell you something. If you're a high school senior and they say, what do you want to be? You're going to college, what do you want to be? And if he said, I want to be a first grade teacher. Everyone would applaud that and say, great job. Mm-hmm. Go do that. And so a first grade teacher make what? Between fifty and $70,000? Average. Right. So I told him. I said, son, you don't have to make millions playing a game. You just need to make what a first grade teacher make. <laughs> if you make what a first grade teacher make playing video games, you are successful. I like right. that. You're successful. So you can go and do exactly what you want to do. You ain't got to, people say, I want to be a comedian. You ain't funny as Kevin Hart. Well, goddamn, I got to be that funny? <laughs> like, it's a whole lot of comedians that ain't yeah. that funny that's making a living. They're making a living. I don't have to be that funny to be a comedian. Right. That's the ball. You ain't no Eddie Murphy. Ah, I got to be the GOAT. You're like, really? <laughs> yeah. But that's what people say to you yeah. when they're putting their limitations on you. And it's only because, you know, they, they didn't think they could do it. So then they tell you, you can't do it. That remind me of uh, Chappelle. He said uh, something similar happened to Dave Chappelle. His dad was like telling him, um, so his dad was a teacher. Mm-hmm. And he was dad, He was telling his dad he wanted to be a comedian. He was like, you ain't gonna never be a successful comedian. He was like, well, it depends on what success means. If I can make as much as a teacher, then I'm a, I'm a success. And you know, That's he, exactly where I heard it. Exactly. That's exactly where I heard it, from, yeah. Dave. Oh, from Dave. And so then I, when my son wanted to be a gamer, I shared the exact same story. Yeah. That's exactly where I heard it. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Dave, shout out to Dave Chappelle, man. And go, oh, yeah. Go for great sure. Great thinker. You know. No, nah, that's what's up, man. Um, so where does the money, where does when is his money come from, like, streaming? A combination of things, streaming, events, contests? Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, they play all kinds of, they play all kinds of competitions when they're not playing league games. Mm-hmm. So they play league games, like, you know, uh, on weekends. Some of them they're online, some of them they travel to. I always say, think about it in terms of like golf. Okay. You know, you have a PGA tour and everybody go out there and you win money based on what place you finish yeah, in. Yeah. And so that's how they win their money. So they have sponsors that pay them and that's how they get paid, pay for all their travel, food and all that stuff. And so, but, but because his winnings are not consistent yeah. His W his W nines, his his ten ninety nine is not at a place where he can buy a house yet. Yeah, and so when I was saying people say, Why are your kids at home? I kept them at home intentionally because I wasn't gonna send them out into the world and let the capitalist vultures put them in a hamster wheel and say, Get the running. You know it's gonna happen. So I told my sons, listen, you have to stay home and these are the three things you gotta do. Your profession has to buy your house, you have to be debt free, and you gotta have a 750 credit score. Mm. If you can do those three things, 
you can leave. Because as a realtor, I have watched so many people, this is what they do. They go to college, they come out of school at 22, 23, they get an apartment paying $2,000 a month, whatever they're paying. <laughs> they get a $700 car payment. Mm -hmm. They go into Miami. They go into Vegas. They buying clothes. They stunting. They doing their thing. Right. Yeah, bro. At about 28 years old, they're like, dang, I'm going to have to pay this back. <laughs> so at 28, now, they're like, let me try to pay this off. After about four or five years of trying to pay it off, at 33, they realize, I'm never going to pay this off. <laughs> Next thing you know, they file bankruptcy. Seven years out of bankruptcy, they 40. Mm. They show up to me, 42 years old, trying to buy a house oh, for the first the time. time. Mm. I never wanted to put my kids in that situation. I'm yeah. like, I'm not going to do that to you. So this is our way of supporting you. You know, I'm not going to just hand you $10 million. You're going to have to do this. Mm. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a foundation and a platform to launch from. And... If you can say, when my son moved out, he paid cash for his lot. Mm. He paid $30,000 cash for his car that he bought. Mm. He had an 800 credit score. He built his house, and he was debt-free. Mm. He was 27. American right. dream. Right. Who can, like, and so now, if you're 27 years old and you have that type of foundation, now when he get his, when he pays himself every month, you know what his money going to? Stock options, real estate investment. That's where all this check going to. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's every every property. week when he pay himself, that's where his money's going. Yeah. And so we're in the process of buying another house now. Man, he drive me crazy because he he my worst real estate client ever, man. <laughs> Dad, what about this? What yeah, about that? Gotta go through you, man. Gotta get <laughs> he through owned, you. he hungry. I gotta yes. give him credit though. He yeah. he he keeps me going. He keeps yeah. me motivated because sometimes as a 51 year old I can I can get a little complacent and a little relaxed sometimes so yeah he keep he keep that battery in my back so I you appreciate know, him for that wow. you know how it is uh, representing those buyers it's like the sellers and investors you know but those buyers yeah exactly you know, buyers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you know as we've done the real estate thing and then as of late we started the B2M podcast Mm, and okay. so that's that's you know I guess that's what we're here to talk about. It's been forty minutes. <laughs> uh, so the B two M podcast is about me, my brother, and my three best friends. Okay, five growing up. up. So it's five of us. Between the five of us, we had thirteen children. Twelve are boys. Oh wow! All of our sons <laughs> have grown up to do really well. Not you know not no superstars, but I think what most parents want: just young, productive. People who are taking care of themselves and they're pursuing their dreams. And not on so, way to, you know. Yeah, so we got, you know, college graduates, master's degrees. I say, you know, from six figure earners at LinkedIn to, you know, iHeartRadio to, oh, to my sons who are entrepreneurs and Call of Duty players, you know. And, and so what our podcast is about is all the things that we went through while we were raising our sons, everything they were going through. So when they had a bad Pop Warner coach or a bad AAU coach, mm -hmm. when they got their heart broke with young ladies, when they, okay. you know, teaching them about money and, and sex and drugs and alcohol and being responsible and academics, everything they went through as we were raising them, how did we handle it yeah. as, as black men? Mm -hmm. You know, and what did we do since we somehow kind of figured out and messed around and got it right? <laughs> you figured it out. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we somehow, you know, uh, messed around and got it right. So it's about what we did. So as you're raising your son and just say he having an issue with his fifth grade teacher, mm -hmm. you might be able to go listen to our podcast about challenging teachers or academic troubles okay. in school. And you can hear what we did when our sons went through that okay. mm -hmm. and how we handled it. And it's not going to tell you what to do. It's just to tell you what we did. Yeah, what you okay. And so yeah. now maybe you can get some ideas that say, you know what? Let me try what Waukee did. Let me try what John did. Let me try what Corey did. You know, let me see if I can work my son through through his issue right now. That's good. You know, man. and so That's good. That's good. I believe, truly believe, that if we do this, one, we can help dispel some myths and stereotypes about black men, their fathers and sons. Mm. But more importantly, we can help people and we can change people's lives. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that may be struggling with their young kids and they may, especially single mothers. Exactly. You know, yeah. they may be struggling and they may not have 
I won't say male figures around. I just say male figures that they trust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because because you really have to trust them to implement whatever advice they may give you. Right. And so the idea being is, hey, let me see what these guys did when 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 their sons was going through this particular thing, right. you know, and how they handled it, and then. It can better relationships. You know, it's a lot of people out here chasing that money, chasing the bag. They chasing it. But, man, they got some jacked up relationships with their kids. Yeah. You yeah. know, they got some exactly. jacked up relationships at home. Yeah. You know, or they got some jacked up relationships with their own parents. Some old baggage that they haven't reconciled with their father, mm-hmm. you know, or mother. And so I hope that our podcast can give some insight on how people can, you know, reconcile some of these relationships. Because I always say life is about relationships. And at the end of life, when you're laying on your deathbed, nobody's talking about how much money they made, the bag, the trip, the vacation. All people are going to talk about are relationships. They're going to talk about the great relationships they had with people that meant so much to them. And they're going to talk about the bad relationships that they wish were better. That's all people want to talk about, you know. Uh, as a young lady, I know it's a hospice nurse, and that's what she says every time. That's all. I wish I had a better relationship with my brother. I wish I had a better relationship with my sister. Mm-hmm. I wish I, me and my mom got along. I wish, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and then, man, I had the best wife in the world, you know. Yeah. Uh, we were always there for each That's what this life is. And if you get it twisted, you know, you be on your deathbed feeling quite empty. And now it's too late for regrets. Yeah, too late then. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, that's what's up, man. Um, That's real dope because, yeah, we definitely do need that in our community, man. It seems like a lot of people just keep making the same mistake over and over again. And it's like, I can't really blame them unless they, if they look at every episode of your podcast, still made those mistakes, now I'm blaming you. But, (laughs) but, you know, they don't have no, you know, they don't have, but you say people, they, they can rely rely on as far as information is by the time they do sometimes it's kind of hard to transition from what they already know to learn and one of the, stuff. one of the most difficult things to do is is to break generational curses you know my grandmother who will be 94 next week she had a child in her house from 1949 to 2019 a child a child was always in her house from 1949 to 2019. And so when my little cousins was coming up, I said, hey, listen, don't y'all bring no babies here. Okay. Grandma ain't raising no more. We, sh- we shutting that down. Yeah. We not, we not, we not, that's yeah. over. Right that's there, dead. Yeah. And don't bring no baby here if you ain't bought no wife or no husband here. And that's how I was, that's how I was carrying it with all of them. Okay. Don't come here with no baby if you don't come here first with a wife or a husband. Because we're not doing that to grandma no more. She getting old. That probably is keeping her alive. That but, probably is but, giving her, <laughs> keeping her youth. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but that was and a small example of how we can break generational curses to say, nah, we're not doing this no more. And none of them did. Okay. None of them did. And so that's really what it's about. Because sometimes, you know, I had a conversation with my mother not too long ago. And my mother's 70 some years old. She, you know, Raised in the Jim Crow era, civil rights era, and all that stuff. She got some scars and some baggage and some trauma mm-hmm. from that time. And we were having a conversation, and she was like, well, you better not do this, because them people going to do this, and them people going to do that. I'm like, Mom, I ain't, I ain't, I'm not. I said, okay, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. I said, and I won't do it again. But she was trying to convince me so much that I realized she wanted me to absorb her trauma in order for me to communicate to her that I actually got it. Understood. And I'm like, Mom, you can give me the message, but don't give me the trauma. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to accept the trauma. I will accept the message, but I'm not going to accept the trauma. I'm not going to move in this world like, don't white folks ain't going to let you do this. Don't white folks ain't. We're not operating like that. I didn't teach my kids that. And so we're not doing none of that. You know, I understand how she feel. I understand her injustices mm-hmm. that happened to her and our family when we were younger, when they were younger, but we trying to break all that. Yeah. And we trying not to carry that on to the next generation. And so that's the important part in terms of not carrying on 
not carrying down, passing down generational traumas uh, yeah. from one generation <laughs> to the next. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, that's real. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, that's cycle. That's crazy. Yeah, you know, that's, that's cycle for real. Dope. It's like I, th- I feel like every I feel like the HBCUs, man, the uh, sociology teachers need to put their students on this type of information, you know, cause, <laughs> you know, when I was going through school, that was basically like the whole sociology, like, you know, they passed going pretty, they passed a good predictor of the future and things of that nature. That's pretty much what I got from my sociology class. Wow. Whatnot. Now, that's what's up. So what time did your brother leave Virginia and migrate out here to this great city we call Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> my brother left Virginia in 92. Uh, can I tell him what happened before you left? So my brother, you know, y'all know my brother. He, he, the the guy y'all know, is not the guy that left Charlottesville. Okay. All right. The guy that left Charlottesville <laughs> had just been charged with two counts of, of attempted murder. Mm. No. Okay. All right. Mm. So he was on that. Yeah. And so he, he was like, you know, after he was found not guilty, um, he was like, yeah, amen, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> Um, after he was found not guilty, his co-defendant got 47 years, though. Yeah. So, yeah, like real, real talk. Um, but after he was found not guilty, he was like, all right, man, I'm going, I'm going to college, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so he came down here to Barter College, to fashion school. He yeah. went there, and uh, he was in the fashion. You know, that dude used to wear a suit to uh, high school. Uh, <laughs> hey, yeah, he was on that, so... <laughs> he came down and he just decided to to turn his life around and and was like I remember when we went to see him behind that glass that day and I was thinking mm. now my mom is right here she crying by the way I, you know our father had passed away when I was 11 he was 9 mm. so mom and grandma everybody we got the village raising yeah. us right. and so mom is right here and she is boohooing yeah. she is boohooing and I was thinking, yo, if I could get behind that glass, I'm going to put something on you because look what you did to, to our mama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I think he received that message. And I think at that moment, he vowed to never hurt mom like that again. And so he completely changed his life and has come down here and just done amazing things with his life and with his son. You know, and I always say, you know, you can tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. bears. And so, you know, you look at Tyreek and his success and what him and his wife, Trina, has done with Tyreek has just been phenomenal. But he just totally changed his life. And I was on my way down here, you know, when I was in school when I was young. But I met my wife at the nightclub that night. (laughs) And I remember they called me. They was like, man, you were supposed to come down here. Where you at? I'm like, man, I done met this girl. <laughs> and they was like, man, all these women down here, we in Atlanta. I'm like, yeah, but I ain't, this is going to be my wife. They were like, what? I said, no, nah, for real, it's going to be my wife. And like, like literally, I was like a week from moving oh, wow. when I met her. And I met her, and three weeks after meeting her, we were talking about getting married. All right. So, That's how yeah. I go, man. Yeah, so, so I knew. That's how I go. Like, they say once it's. That's how a lot of a lot of stuff happens, especially in the entrepreneurship world. You yeah, know? and they uh they they relate that to taking action. You know, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah I took action. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, um, so I right, so I mean, you know, you you know, you being a young, you know, cool dude, successful, could have had other options, but you chose the best option. I'm sure that means that she compliments you and your personal and business life a lot, man. So you know, I like to hear a little little about that, bro. She she's everything in terms of what we do. Like, for real. Um, primarily because I was saying this to earlier to somebody. I'm a big picture guy. Mm. I'm terrible with the details. Me I'm too. terrible checking the mail. Me I'm too. terrible <laughs> filling out paperwork. I'm, I am, oh, excuse me, I am absolutely horrible at that. that. And she holds it down. <laughs> and when you, especially when you're in the real estate business, I tell anybody that's interested, especially as a realtor, when you get in that business, um, it was wonderful. My wife was a school teacher. It was wonderful that she had a salary that we made sure our lifestyle did not exceed her salary. salary. Yeah. So that when we fell on hard times, we could sustain. I could continue to be an entrepreneur. I couldn't be an entrepreneur without her. Right. I could not be one. In 2009, 2008 crash, 2009. In 2009, that year, 
I made ten thousand dollars as a realtor All right. for the year. Ooh, ooh. For the year, what one deal? Or something? Probably, Three yeah. little ones. <laughs> <laughs> Three little mm-hmm. ones. I made ten thousand dollars that year. There's no way mm-hmm. we would be able to sustain our quality of life if my wife was not holding it down with her teaching job. And so it allows me to ride the roller coaster of the real estate business. You know, I tell people, if you want to survive in the real estate business, the best thing you can do is keep your personal life in check. Mm -hmm. Don't go buy no Hummer. Don't go buy no 500 S-Class Mercedes. Like, yeah, like you can do that, (laughs) but when you do it, you better pay cash for it. You know, because yeah. because that thousand dollar payment come rolling around and you ain't you had did. no closings, <laughs> it's a different ball game, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, as we, you know, as our kids got older, that's when I transitioned into doing investments, my okay. properties, yeah. and you know, fixing up to one or two, and and uh, having tenants and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's what that's what we do. And so, ideally, you know, we make enough money with that, you know, that'll be our residual income that we can go okay. so live on live on the beach. So you're a realtor, um, but you got some buy and hold properties where you got tenants. Yes. And you'll flip a house, you know, you every flip, now and then. Me and my brother just then. done one back where well, we flipped it mid February, we sold it. Yeah. yeah. So we did one together. Um okay. that was the first one we had ever done together. Um looking to do some more. Um but but you know I was I was very apprehensive about putting myself out there mm-hmm. when my kids were in school and they in private school and we got to pay that tuition and all that stuff. I'm like, I can't. I, I chose not to take risks. No. I, sometimes I wish I had, but it's kind of delayed my financial success a little bit. But it was just a conscious decision I made in terms of my family no, and, and, and putting them first and making them a priority. Um, I don't know what got in my mind that I couldn't do both. But somehow I had it in my mind I couldn't do both, um, and so I, I, you know, I think you can do both. Yeah. Um, but that's not what I chose to do. But right. I think you can. Right. Nice. Right. What's up? Um, you, you gonna say something? I was just saying, as long as you got a good wife, you could have did both. Yeah, man, for mm-hmm. real. That's yeah. that's real. And you know, I, I tell people all the time. Um, <coughs> you know, I told I told my wife. I said we're gonna write a book there called "Don't Let Your Money Problems Become Your Marital Problems." Mm. because we've been together 30 years. We've never had one argument over money. Okay. Never. Listen not to that one. now. Now one I'm argument. I'm about that one. I'm yes. about that one. <laughs> when, I, when I'm on that path, I'm going to start reading it. Yeah, you because, know. because you know why we never had one argument? Go ahead. Because all the money in this house was us. Well, one. Was one. Yeah. And so she never looked at me like, you ain't sell no house this month. You know what I mean? I'm like, all you making is that teaching money. You know what I mean? We would never, if we had a financial crisis, and we did, and we had them. I can imagine. We were in it together. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't my financial problem. It was our financial problem. She saw it that way, and I saw it that way. Even our kids, when we were growing, when they were growing up, I ain't never give allowance. I ain't giving no allowance. You know why? Because that money already in this house. <laughs> you need to go out and figure out how to bring, bring some money in. in. If yeah. you want some money, figure out a way to make some money. I'm not giving you no five dollars, twenty dollars, no nine. Give you a quarter. You're gonna have to figure out how to make you some money, and I ain't giving you nothing. Right. And my son is 29 years old. I ain't gave him money since he was 10. <laughs> Sound about right? No, since he was 10. Yeah. For real. So yeah, so yeah, no, no, wife, wife, absolutely holds it down. Holds it down, and I always tell her, the money I make is the money for fun. That's the money we go on cruises with. That's the money we go to Paris with. That's the money we go to, you know, wherever we going on cruises in Miami, Las Vegas, wherever we going, you know, Caribbean. That my money is the fun money. (laughs) So when, so when, you know. So if we ain't having no fun, it's because I ain't made no money. <laughs> but it don't. Hundred percent. But but they not gonna take my house. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, they yeah, not yeah. gonna take my house. You know. So yeah, that's that's how that's how we roll. Okay. So real estate investor um, slash realtor, mm-hmm. manager of a um, Call of Duty player. Yeah. You know, and father of the son that runs the nun. Emergency medical transportation company. 
You got, I'm also athletic director of the school. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to get to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're athletic director of which school? Uh, it's called Peabody School. It's, Peabody? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small private school in Charlottesville, and that school is dedicated, and it, it, um, it serves what they call high IQ students. Okay. So really, oh, wow. really smart kids. So we got kids who have graduated eighth grade and gone to college. Mm. We got kids taking AP exams and they're in seventh grade. You know, so the kids are really, really smart. And my oldest son went to that school. And when he went to that school, I was like the parent volunteer coaching the yeah, basketball yeah, team. But when he left in 08, they were like, will you stay and keep coaching? And I was <laughs> like... Okay. Of course, they play chess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. <laughs> yes, they do. But we got basketball, soccer, lacrosse. I mean, basketball, soccer, baseball, swimming, volleyball, cross country, and track and field. Oh, and I'm about to okay. add. I'm about to add uh, ultimate frisbee this year. Ultimate. Frisbee. So yeah. So that's what, so so I just so I'm at that school just out of appreciation and dedication for what that school has meant to our family because my wife is a teacher there. Okay. Oh, well, my wife teaches teacher. there. My wife okay. still teaches there. Our son went there what 17 years ago, whatever. <laughs> but I'm still there and um and so, you know, and, and so. people have offered me other athletic director jobs. I'm like, no, I'm not interested in some other AD job. I'm only here because of this school, yeah. um, because of what that school has meant for our family. And, um, and, and so I love doing that. I love the kids. Yeah. You know, I, I love seeing the kids go on to do great things. And they do go on to great things because they just, they're yeah, already brilliant. Smart, you know, they yeah. 150 IQ kids, you know what I mean? They're yeah. they, they on a different level, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you're not going to pull a Deion Sanders? No. <laughs> Take it, tell his <laughs> yeah, no. If I was gonna do that, I'd have left when my son left. <laughs> and uh yeah, he left in yeah. 08 and I'm still there, man. Nah. Yeah. I, you know, and it's funny too because, you know, unfor in our area, in our area, it's, it, it it doesn't really it doesn't break down along racial lines, but it just happens to be one of them quote unquote rich white schools. Mm -hmm. You know, so people are like, man, you know, you serving these kids and you know, what about these what about our kids? other kids, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and I served those kids as well through AAU and Pop Warner and stuff like that when I, when I was coaching. Through your podcast um, as well. And through yeah, my too. podcast as well. And you know what? Now. It's so funny. I was just texting one of those kids like right before we came to sit down he turned 31 years old today, mm. and we still have a relationship. Just I like still that. communicate with those guys. You know, I got some that's doing great. They're raising their families, and I got others. I got a message I can show you on my phone because he incarcerated, and I sent him money, mm. you know. And yeah. so I tell them all the time, our team is the Charlottesville Cavaliers. Like, once you play for me, you're a part of my family forever. Yeah. And that don't go nowhere. Sure and I don't care if you're raising your family or if you incarcerated, I got you as much as I can, you know, and I'm going to be there for you. Man. So that's how, you know, that's how I operate. Best yeah. coach ever, man. Yeah. <laughs> Best coach. Never I had a coach like that one. I try. I try. You know, it's, it's been fun, man, and just watching those kids come up and, 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 and do well and always encouraging them to, to pursue their dreams. My son was asking me about, one of the players that he played with just yesterday. And I was like, oh, you know, he played for the Colorado Rockies. And, you know what I mean? Like, he, he had triple A, he been up and down, you know, but that's where he yeah, is, no. you know. Another one of my son's friends playing for Tampa Bay. And, you know, just I just love watching young people pursue their dreams, mm. you know, it's because there's no reason not to. Exactly. There's no reason not to. You don't got to go work in no factory. All yeah, right. you got to do that. that that's Tell old, you me. know. And that's what our our parents and our grandparents did. They gave us they gave us nineteen seventy five information for yep. two thousand. Yeah, it didn't apply. Dang it didn't apply. The principles may apply, but the specifics and the details didn't necessarily apply. And right. so that's what we. You know, I tell the kids, oh, man, y'all don't know how awesome it is to have Google. I ain't had Google growing up. <laughs> you know, you ask old people something, you don't know what they tell you back in the day. Right. You know, and now. You can research and find out for yourself. So like that was that. always my thing, man. You know, that was it. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. Dope coach. Dope coach. Yeah. 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 
But All right, anything cool. else? Yeah, you got anything else? No, go ahead. Okay. Um. Well, you got anything you want to leave before we uh break? Oh, leave man. with the audience. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, like for real, my whole message is pursue your dream. And I know that's real cliche, but so what if it don't work? Try something else. So what if it don't work? Try something else, you know? And 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 people always say, you you in college, what are you majoring in? And they're like, well, I'm not sure. Now you ain't pick something, and if you don't like it, pick something else. And if you don't like it, pick something else. And if you don't like it, pick something else. You know, so what, you know, that's that's my message to, to young people and to parents. I'm always gonna say, please support your children. Right. Please support your children as best you can. Mm -hmm. As best you can. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with, you know, follow the B2M crew podcast on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. please okay. subscribe. Subscribe to the B2M podcast on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of that stuff. We're, we're growing. We are new and we're growing. And we want you to be a part of the B2M crew family for a long time because what I think is very important is that we need to elevate the position of matriarch and patriarch in our families again. Right. We need to honor those people, Big Mama and them, mm -hmm. you know, Paw Paw and them, whoever you call them, Granddad and them. We need to honor them. And, and it's people our age that need to be willing to step into those roles. Because right. when Grandma pass away, who house we coming to too. now? Yeah. Who house we coming to now? Okay. We made all these memories at Grandma's house now. And right. Grandma gone. So now, who's willing to be the auntie to step up or the uncle to step up and say, hey, y'all come to my house now. Yeah. We're going to have dinner here. Y'all can play out in the yard here. Y'all can play basketball in the driveway here. Y'all can start to build family memories right mm -hmm. here at our home. And it's a big sacrifice, but it's extremely rewarding because that's what my house has been. And so I, I'm just thrilled. So follow it. the B2M Crew podcast and please subscribe on YouTube. Absolutely, man. So we're going to close it with that. Been uh, another episode of Multiple Streams by Any Means. And remember, good things go to those that hustle. Max.